Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Colonel Jay Condry, I'm your garrison commander. And first of all, let me let me thank you for for joining tonight. Um, I appreciate all the questions in advance, uh, and I appreciate the fact that I've got lots of experts out there that are going to help me answer, uh, especially some of those where I come up short. Um, I know there's lots lots been going on lately, um, and and I want to take a few moments to to give you some highlights, whether it's related to COVID, uh, whether it's related to changes across the garrison. Uh, linked to COVID. Uh, so we continue to do well in terms of our, our prevention of transmission. Uh, and so as a result, uh, today you noticed many of you as you came on or off the installation that uh, the health protection condition went from Charlie down to Bravo. Uh, and so that, that's indicative of the efforts of this community. It's indicative of, of the, you know, of the efforts of, of the greater Stuttgart area as a whole. Uh, in terms of, of what we've done, uh, our understanding and our efforts, you know, to some, you know, the basics of, of hand washing, physical distancing, wearing a mask when you can't maintain six feet of physical separation, all those things. I think the, the results of that are starting to be, be so shown. There are still cases that pop up. Um, there are still deaths each and every day that remind us that we're, you know, we're not done with this just yet. Um, I do want to highlight that uh, you know we continue to expand services. We continue to reopen things uh, to get us back to a sense of of, of uh, some sort of normal. Um, I know on earlier this week, uh, you know we, we've allowed private organizations to begin to do do some of their meetings. It was tied very closely with the host nation uh, limiting their. Uh, or changing their restrictions on how many people can get together from different homes. Uh, you know, of course, there's there's a distinction between, uh, you know, a private event and a non-private event, whether you're doing it indoors and outdoors. Uh, and I, I, I assess that those conditions will continue to change. It'll continue to change as we, we make progress against the virus, uh, as we learn more about the virus. Uh, and so, you know, with those kinds of conditions, we're gonna we're gonna continue to, you know, with those changes in the host nation, we're gonna continue to, to update. And and I know you've heard me say this before, we will lag in some cases. In some cases, that won't be necessary. Um, I know there's some questions with relate as it relates to to private organizations uh, to when they can do fundraising, whether it's you know the sale of certain items or or, or food sales. We're working with our public health officials to make sure that we we understand exactly what kind of precautions need to be taken uh, as it relates to COVID and, and we'll get that information out as soon as possible. Uh, we cheated a little bit this evening. Uh, I know published last night some of the some of the pending changes uh, and so there's already a, an article out on Stuttgart Citizen that highlights a lot of the things that I'm about to go through now um, but do want to highlight that we're going to reopen playgrounds. Um, you know that that's a that's something that uh, has been a concern of a lot across the community. Um, and, you know, I still don't know if there, if we've had a change in, in the risk associated with contact with the virus on our playground equipment, you know, whether it's wood, plastic, metal. Um, and so I think what's gonna be important uh, is that we wash hands, make sure our kids wash hands before you go out to the playground, after you come off the playground. Um, but if we're gonna have birthday parties, whether it's in the home or outside the home, uh, and we've got kids mixing it up, uh, then it doesn't make much sense to keep our, our community playgrounds closed. We continue to get more research, you know, whether it's from the states or, or here in the, the state of Baden-Württemberg. I know they just recently completed a four university study that was focused on you know, the, the risk of transmission from, from children that remain in the home versus those that are out and about. Uh, and interacting with other kids. And they compared not only the, the kids' interactions, but the interactions with, uh, you know, kids with their parents and then any any uh, any implications there. And the results of their study, I think, are going to guide, uh, at least within the state of Baden-Württemberg, uh, how quickly they reopen uh, other things uh, where, you know, we have our children interact together. So effective tomorrow, and, and I know that in some cases there's probably kids standing out on playgrounds right now that are cheering this, um, playgrounds are open. Monday, we will start opening some other things that, that you as a community have been asking for. First is child development centers. We spent the last two weeks and even more uh, making sure that our staff, 
is trained and ready to implement the new protocols that have been directed. It's going to be very different. Uh, and so for parents that, uh, that, that, that have kids in child care, there's, there's going to be some new measures, whether it's how to drop off, how to pick up. Um, it's going to look a little bit different. Um, and we're going to look for opportunities to increase services to the number of, of kids that we have. Because right now, because it's different, because we are limiting interaction between uh, age groups, uh, between you know, the care providers, um, you know, that, that's forced us to have some additional staffing requirements that prevent us from opening up back to where we were um, before COVID occurred. Uh, and so we're going to continue to assess this. We're going to look for opportunities. We're looking for, for more care, care providers. The 9th of June will be our next hiring fair. So if you're interested in, uh, in being part of our, our child development centers, then, then we're interested in, in you as well. Um, and so those process are, processes are ongoing. Um, we're going to make sure that that, that environment that we, you know, we provide uh, while parents are at work uh, is the safest possible environment. Finally, reopening gyms. Again, much like the CDCs, it's not going to be to the level that, that you saw. I'm not going to be able to turn on 24 access right away. Uh, and so uh, it's going to be, it's going to be a, a, an initial operating uh, process. Uh, and I think we will very quickly figure out how we can expand that. Um, we still have you know, both host nation guidance uh, and public health guidance that says in this type of space, doing this kind of exercise, you can only have this many people uh, and so it, it's going to require some you know some people to understand the you know the boundaries how many people can be in this room what kind of activity can be done in this room uh, we're trying to find a way to, to do that in blocks of time uh, that allow our service members to, to meet the physical readiness requirements that they have as part of being in uniform and at the same time find opportunities for for our civilian workforce and, and even our family members to, to to get into our fitness centers uh, it's it's going to be rough as we we implement this. I know uh, there's been lots of uh, interaction with mission partners across the footprint, some feedback from them. It's going to look a little different uh, at, e at each installation in terms of when hours are going to be available. Um, we've got to maintain an understanding of who's in our fitness centers when, uh, so that if we have somebody that turns up positive, we can very quickly uh, trace any potential contacts. Uh, there's additional requirements as it comes to cleaning and, and, and sanitizing all the equipment. There's going to be individual responsibilities as a user of all of our equipment. And then, of course, uh, you know, the fitness center staff and our custodial staff, they're going to be doing additional cleanings uh, that meet the guidance, uh, both, both of the host nation and, uh, and, and that we put out through Department of Defense channels. Uh, and, and I will tell you that we will find ways to improve upon that and, and do things better and, and ideally create more opportunities for, for us to get back to the levels of, of use of the fitness centers that, that we had before. And, and before all of this, we didn't have enough physical fitness center space to begin with. We were 60,000 feet short uh, if you looked at the total number of people on the, on the installation. So as quickly as we can do things safely, we're going to expand what we're doing in our child development centers, what we're doing in our physical fitness centers. And, and I, I, I'm looking forward to the, to the feedback. Uh, I'm looking forward to ideas. Um, and I recognize they can come from a lot of different directions. We're gonna start putting tables and chairs back in our food courts, uh, allow people to sit down in, in the bowling alley. We're gonna allow bowling in our bowling alley. Um, and then of course our canteens across each of the installations um, we're going to figure out how to do dining both indoors and outdoors. Um, and for those of you that have been off post and been to a restaurant out there, you, you see the, the, the kind of information collection that's necessary to make that possible. Again, I uh, want to make sure that if we do have any issues with, with uh, COVID-19, that we're very, very quickly able to trace any potential contacts and, and isolate and so not allow uh, any spread and continue the success that this community has had. We're going to start opening up um, some child and youth sports and some skies activities. You know, tennis, music, language lessons, uh, track and field, agility, archery, smart start. There, there's lots of things that uh, with very little adaptation, we can maintain, um, you know, the physical distancing necessary, um, do a lot of the things that we were doing before. Um, 
and especially now as school is ending, I know there's there's a desire to have have some some structure back into uh, back into these summer days. And so, you know, I, in some cases, you'll be able to sign up immediately uh, as quickly as we can. We're going to get the you know get the points of contact, uh, the information out there, so that if this is something that you're looking to do, we can put the dates out there. You can know when to sign up. You know, things like Warrior Adventure Quest. You know, those are things that we've done. You know, kind of like climbing activities. We, we're not going to be able to pile into a van and all go to one location. We're going to figure out how to do that with separate means of travel. Uh, but those are the kind of things that we will, you know, we will re-implement. Uh, our community clubs and conference rooms. Now that we're doing, you know, private and non-private events again, it makes sense that the facilities that we have available to the community, we make available to the community. Uh, so I know many of you will, will have already started making reservations and, and will continue to do so. There's going to be a requirement for each one of those events, you know, whether it's something you're doing in one of one of our facilities, whether it's part of a, a unit organized event or whether it's a birthday party you're planning. There's a requirement to, to make sure that you maintain an understanding, a document that says, hey, these people attended so that, again, uh, if we go back and and, and have to trace contacts based upon somebody being positive for COVID, uh, that we can do that quickly. We have names, we have contact information, all those things that are that are going to be necessary. We've published that, you know, a, a template as to how you might do that, depending on what kind of event. Uh, so th that's going to be hung on our website. Pull that down, take a look at it. Uh, it outlines the measures that are necessary, uh, and and the current host nation standards as to what type of event and what type of venue uh, the maximum number of people that that uh, that you can have. And so what I will tell you is that those things change. Uh, and in some cases, they change very rapidly. Um, they'll change with a court decision. They'll change with a press release. And so as quickly as we find out about the change, uh, we'll be sure to let the community know. We'll keep you updated using the app, using StuttgartCitizen.com, all those kind of things. Um, The hunting course, we had a hunting course that was ongoing when COVID first happened. We shut it down mid-stride. We're gonna find a way to resume that and other future hunting courses. Horseback riding, soccer training. You know, As we look at the things that we've always done, we're gonna try and find a way that within the current COVID you know, mitigation measures that we can do the things that the community has always wanted to do and, and is looking forward to do. So those are the things that, that are now up on the StuttgartCitizen.com. I think they were up as of 1400 this afternoon. I am asking for your assistance in, in sharing sharing that information. Um, I, I know that no matter no matter how many different places we put it, um, how many times I say it in a venue like this, uh, there are still people that, that don't get the information. And so I'm, I'm dependent upon the, you know, the, the word of mouth to, to pass a lot of this information as well. And, and thanks in advance for your assistance in doing that. I'll jump right into some of the questions uh, that you sent in. And so first one comes from Geraldine. So this one's related to General Order 1. With borders reopening, we'll be able to begin non-official travel within the Schengen area. Also, any estimates on when overnight stays will be approved? Stephanie, similar question. ETA on overnights in Germany. Casey, Italy just opened travel in an official email. We received, are we allowed to travel there? And then Jennifer, a similar question. Some EU countries have opened their borders in Italy to EU citizens. It doesn't, I know that doesn't mean it's safe to travel. There's still a stop movement order and the UK still has two week quarantine upon entering. Still like clarification. So all those kind of fall into the, you know, the travel order, the general order uh, question. So looking right now uh, at a, a a, a revamp of the general order and hope to have it out soon. Uh, the, it is still linked to the Department of Defense uh, stop move order with respect to unofficial leisure travel. And so as soon as we, you know, the conditions have been set, as soon as we get the authorizations, very quickly plan on publishing a general order that allows travel. Uh, and, and I think in overnight stays, and, and I anticipate that overnight stays within Germany will, will probably be the first thing you see. Uh, and then in a conditions-based approach, travel to other countries within the EU. And of course, 
that may be subject to change. That may, you know, a spike in one location, a spike in a nation. Uh, there are going to be conditions that every nation puts in place uh, that, that our leadership, Department of Defense leadership, puts in place as to what may limit travel. And so uh, from that perspective, uh, we'll continue to update it as things change. And then if things change where we see a, a limitation that comes into play, we'll be quick to let the community know that that's happening. Uh, but the intent is to is to produce as soon as possible a, a general order uh, one revision uh, that very closely aligns with the things that we are seeing uh, with our host nation uh, with our host nation guidelines. So this question is from Jamie, and it's could you it's related to CDCs. Could you please ex please explain the measures take being taken at daycares when they open with the, with reduced capacity? I would like to know if they are separating the children during playtime and if they will even be able to interact with other kids. So Jamie, a um, couple different ways I'm, I'm, I, I can answer that question. In terms of the, the, uh, you know, the, the age ratio, the, the, the group that, that your child will, uh, will be with, they will play together, they'll go outside together. They won't have interaction necessarily with, uh, with other age groups. and, and in many cases, that was the, the situation before COVID. Uh, but the intent is to, you know, limit uh, exposure to it as much as possible. That one group that your your child will interact with, be with, those care providers that your child will interact with and be with uh, day in and day out. Our caregivers will wear masks. Our our kids, you know, they, they can't, in most cases, wear masks. And, even, and they probably wouldn't wear them proper, properly if they, they attempted to. Um, we don't have any limitations on on caregivers, you know, being able to touch. I mean, you, you can't change a diaper without without touching uh, one of the children. I know as you look off the installation, there's a, a very broad range of, of uh, differences in how, you know, kindergartens, daycare centers are, are operating uh, as it relates to COVID. Um, because our caregivers are wearing masks, um, they, they can't be in the classroom all day the, the 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 staffing almost doubles the staffing requirement almost doubles which is why um you know the the amount of care we're able to offer uh is 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 much less than what it was before covid and so they go out they'll be able to play outside you know, we have some requirements to make sure that we we clean the playground equipment before the next group of kids comes out there again to make sure that that uh that we're going to provide the you know, the safest environment for, for kids while, while mom and dad are, are at work. I've got a question here about installation access, primarily ID cards. Uh, and, and the questions highlight really a, a discrepancy we're trying to work through right now as to what is the expiration date for an ID card that may have already expired. So I will tell you that I've asked the ID card office to open up uh, to, to create an opportunity for people to come in. I would ask that we, you know, if you're just looking to change the rank on your ID card, uh, that, that you wait a little bit longer to do that. Uh, but if you have an expired ID card, please make an appointment to come in and, 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 and get that done. Um, we have the ability to extend an expired ID card out to the 30th of June right now. That, that may change with, with policy uh, in the next day or so. Uh, but right now, that's the limit in terms of our ability to extend an ID card that's already, already, uh, already expired. So, want to find an opportunity to to get people into the uh, the ID card office and uh, and ensure that we don't have any issues with installation access. And so, you know, Julian, specifically, you asked, is are there any caveats to renewing ID cards only for people PCSing out? Absolutely not, Julian. It, it, you know, obviously, I want to make sure that we. We, we make, you know, anybody that's leaving imminently uh, that we find a way to, to, to get them taken care of. Uh, but, but we're not limiting who can come in and make an appointment at our ID card office at all. Iona, you asked about seated dining. So as part of the Deutsche Cantina and Patch Barracks, when we're we gonna be allowed to have tables outside and inside? Customers are asking every day. So Iona, as soon as we can put together the plans, and I know our, our team's been talking to you, want to make sure that we're meeting the same kind of standards that we're seeing off the installation uh, with respect to physical distancing, how we capture who sits at each table, uh, and how long we maintain that data. Uh, and so 
indoors, outdoors, ready to start doing that as, as soon as you've, you've got the measures in place that allow that to happen. This one's related to driver's licenses. So both Juan and Leanne asked, when will the driver's license office be open back up for appointments? Getting the app, specifically, I wanna be able to get an application for an international driver's license. So as of today, driver's license office is accepting appointments. Go to the, go to the app, go to the, you know, look at the PCS button and select driver's license. We'll be able to make an appointment right there. Becky, you asked about new guidance from MWR on private organizations already approved the ability to do meetings. Again, I'm asking private organizations to use that COVID mitigation plan that, that we've published. Uh, in terms of things as it relates to fundraising, food sales, um, we've got a couple more checks to, to, to do with our public health officials and then we'll put out some guidance very quickly that allows uh, public uh, or private organizations that wanna do, do those kind of things to do them as quickly as possible. So passports. Um, I know there's still some concerns with passports, especially as, as people are leaving. Um, I know those questions have been asked, you know, by our high headquarters, um, you know, engagement with Department of State, um, you know, and, and I know the Department of State is making efforts right now to, to bring in the workforce, expand the workforce to be able to meet the, the, the demand that not providing that service for a couple of months has provided. Um, and so I've asked our team here to, to figure out how we can start you know, doing the initial paperwork uh, so that when that is turned on, we were already push and send on an application. So more to follow on that, um, and, and I hope to have a good answer soon uh, and, and be able to convey uh, what the Department of State uh, is going to do as it relates to some of the things that they've, they've, been, uh, they've been waiting on. This question is from Patrick, and it's about policy. And it's when will garrison facilities allow walk-ins instead of asking if we can have an appointment for out processing? Patrick, the, the, the concern I have with, with walk-ins is I don't really have a good area for a waiting room, a uh, waiting room that meets, uh, meets the, the, you know, the COVID mitigation requirements. Um, you know, in some cases we've been able to do walk-ins. In some cases we are able to, with an email or a phone call, able to create you know, kind of the walk-in conditions, especially with some of the, you know, emergent considerations out there. Uh, the place that we opened up, you know, just this week for, for walk-ins was our vehicle registration. But you'll notice that if you've walked in, you're standing outside because, you know, as long as people are physically distanced outside, that, uh, you know, that, that's a better way to do that. Uh, it's, it's not feasible out of a lot of the locations that we provide our services. Uh, and I'm, I'm trying to avoid a, you know, hallways stacked with people lined up down the, down the hall. And so we're, we're trying to figure out as much as possible how much we can do virtually. And so that appointment is a 15 minute appointment instead of a 30 minute or an hour long appointment. And so those are the things that, that our service providers are working very quickly to implement. Um, you know, we started about six weeks ago on that. As people are in processing now, we're, we're doing that with a lot of those newcomers. Uh, and, and we will get better, you know, in the coming weeks and days. And, and I think you'll see the things that, that used to take us a while to do. We'll find a way to, to transmit, you know, paperwork, signatures, uh, do all those things um, online so that for whatever interaction is needed to, to you know, to occur face to face, whether it's, you know, coming in to pick up a rations card, coming to get VAT forms, uh, dropping off a passport for a, you know, for the insert of a SOFA card. Uh, all those kind of things. We want to find out how we can do that and minimize that contact, um, you know, uh, with that service provider. Minimize that time that you spend in the office, because uh, I think all of that, you know, is you know as, as much time as possible. You know, that that minimization is going to be better for everyone. So, Patrick, you know, where we can do that, we'll attempt to do that. Um, you know, and and uh, some places it'll be easier than others. Got a couple uh, medical questions, or perhaps these are more COVID questions. Uh, Aubrey asks, are there still rules about isolation with suspected COVID and waiting for test results? If the test is negative, can someone return to base to work? A civilian that works on base that was tested yesterday uh, off base, what can they do? Uh, so uh, Aubrey, you know, the, I've said all along that a, a positive test is very informative, but a negative test is only one data point, one moment in time when that 
that individual doesn't have, uh, um, you know, doesn't have COVID. And so in most cases, I've seen someone that's awaiting the results of a, a, uh, a COVID test uh, to be directed into, you know, into isolation pending the results of that test. I know that's what's happening for anybody that gets tested off the installation. And depending on what kind of test, um, that, that may occur on the installation, especially if there's some sort of symptoms involved. Uh, I will tell you that the doctor that does the test will give the specific guidance on what actions need to take. Um, as I look at the way forward, and especially as we bring new members into this community, we're going to do some additional testing. We're going to screen some of the people that come in. Uh, we're going to make sure that, that as they come in, they're, they're, you know, they do an initial test, and we want to confirm whether or not they're you know, they're, you know, an asymptomatic carrier of the virus. We will do another test in, you know, the 72 hour or 96 hour, three or four days later mark, uh, and see if, you know, that travel on the airplane, if there was somebody near them that was carrying the virus that, that may have infected them. So we want as much as possible, do some, do some testing, um, and, and make sure that as we're, we're, you know, we're looking at those requirements, we're mitigating as much as possible, uh, the potential of the virus to spread. Um, this question from Lee, again, uh, kind of a COVID question, but focused on, you know, our, our packers. So how often are, are our moving crews, uh, health certificates being renewed? Uh, is it every day? Is it every, you know, after every household they've been to? Uh, so, so Lee, I'll tell you that, that we have two primary companies that we work with, uh, and, and they have an obligation, uh, to, to medically clear every crew that they bring on to do, you know, packing, unpacking within our, uh, within our homes. Um, I am asking right now to find out how frequent that is. Uh, I know that they do some additional assessments to make sure that anybody that's not feeling well doesn't come to work. They don't want to lose a moving crew. Uh, and they also don't want to, don't want to, you know, bring sickness into anyone's house. Uh, so I, I don't have the answer as to whether or not it's a, you know, it's an everyday thing. It's a every other day thing. Uh, we'll continue to look and see if we can get, get that answer. And, and especially if you've got Packers coming into your home, we'll, we'll try and get that question answered uh, uh, before, they, before they enter. Okay, the last, uh, you know, that's most of the questions we had in there. Um, I, I do want to cover uh, one more topic, and I know it's a question that, that a lot of people had. Um, not necessarily related to COVID, uh, but related to, you know, what we've seen in the news, what we've heard about from our, our families, those that we care about back, back in the States. Uh, and the questions relate to, um, what we've watched and, uh, and, you know, upcoming gatherings and demonstrations that, that are going to be happening here in Germany. Uh, and so, you know, with those events, uh, those protests, uh, those demonstrations, those visuals, those remembrances uh, focused on uh, on George Floyd's death. Um, a lot of questions as to whether or not service members, family members, civilians uh, can go and participate. And I will tell you that there is a Department of Defense instruction that is very specific about people that are wearing uniform, uh, what they are able to do. And so that DOTI prohibits our participation if you are wearing a uniform while in a foreign country. And that's because we must remain mindful that we are here as guests. Uh, and I know that you know, if you're wearing this uniform, you've, you've, you've sworn an oath, you've raised your right hand to protect and defend the Constitution. Freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, those are things that we hold very dear. And I'll take that a step further because as the garrison commander, in addition to that oath, my duty is focused on the protection of this community. That's a force protection requirement. It's focused on the facility. That's focused on the installation, but it's also focused on the, the members of this community. And, you know, very apparent in the last three months is also the, the, the health protection requirements associated with that. And so for every demonstration, whether it was related to this or, or you know, anything that came up in the past, uh, the questions I'd always ask, always ask our, our liaisons with, with local law enforcement, our intelligence agencies, is to take a look at whether or not there's going to be an active threat, 
against members of our community, against Americans, uh, whether they are down near the, the demonstration, around it. Um, and I will tell you that as we look at the things that are happening, uh, the one scheduled for Leyenberg here soon, that 7,500 people anticipated to, you know, to participate there. And so the question from a force protection, uh, from a protection of family members is that want to make sure that violence ahead of during and after is not something that any member of our community falls prey to. So that plus the fact that it's difficult to maintain the protections necessary, the mitigations we're required to maintain by host nation law when it comes to, to COVID prevention. And so service members, you're not allowed to participate in any type of demonstration off post. Civilians, family members, you may participate. Uh, I'd ask that you ensure that your words, what you wear, your actions, they don't connect you to the Department of Defense or so the reason why we're all here. We've got to respect host nation law and we've got to respect the, you know, the restrictions that have been put in place to protect us, protect our community, protect our families from COVID. And so I recognize the fact that service members can't participate is a problem. It, it doesn't fill a need that many have expressed. And so we've asked for the opportunity to find a way to do gatherings. Um, and do them on the installation. And so that creates an opportunity for, for this community to come together to address uh, some of the very concerns that you brought up tonight. And so I, we've asked those questions um, and, and we anticipate getting some guidance very soon as to how we can do that. Uh, because, you know, in the past, you know, the, we have ensured that our installations were not a, were not a venue for you know, for any type of, of political activity. Our job is to remain apolitical, uh, but we understand how, how this is impacting our community, uh, what we're seeing, how that's impacting, you know, those that we care about, those that we love. And so there's a desire to have those conversations and, and hopefully I'll be able to share with you how we can do that, uh, whether it's, you know, with, with organizations, chaplains, there, there are lots of, uh, lots of ways we're looking to, to to address and meet that need. And so hopefully we'll have some guidance soon. I'll be able to, to convey that to the community and, and, and provide more guidance. So with that, are there any questions? Yeah, a few come in, um, many being answered by the community uh, as we go through. So uh, Mikel has asked, uh, with going back to HP Con Bravo, is there still a requirement for the guards at post services, uh, the screeners? So Miguel, one of the biggest things that our our screeners do at our services uh, and, and in some cases you've seen where we've removed them is, is maintain uh, the capacity limitations that, that have been placed upon us uh, from a host nation perspective. And so the, you know, I, I'll use the patch express as an example. There's no way walking up into the, you know, into the door that you will know uh, if you are the 15th or the 16th individual going into that facility. Uh, and so, that screener there is 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 focused on you know ensuring that we don't overload that facility that we don't violate our agreement uh and the and the the limitations that have been put in place there may be a a better way to do that and and we will continue to look for ways to do that that, that doesn't require somebody to to kind of count heads um and we'll look for ways to do that in our fitness centers and in other places uh but until we're able to you know, for those very small spaces, um, have a way that, that, that limits, you know, prevents us from exceeding the, you know, the, the access uh, that, whether it's a regulation or public health guidance is put out there, uh, then I think we're gonna continue to need to do that. So either the conditions change where, where the threat of, of spreading the virus is an, an issue, or we find an innovative way, you know, to, to let you know as you walk up that number one, there's not too many people in the facility and number two that you're next uh, so those are some things that, that we're trying to work through yes. um, unrelated to covid uh, michael asks what happened to all the patient parking at the clinic uh, with areas being blocked for clinic initiatives where are the patients going to park so uh, what was the name uh, that was michael michael great great question and so uh we, we've got a parking garage right next to the clinic that we plan to use for that. Of course, 
in the process of, of sealing the concrete in that parking garage. Uh, and with that has come some, some interesting issues. Uh, but 63 spaces as we closed off, you know, the clinic parking lot uh, were opened up uh, in the parking garage and very soon we'll flip flop those and, and 90 spaces will become available. And then soon after that, uh, it'll be the full parking garage that's open. Uh, but the intent is that that parking garage offsets the space that we took away in order to maintain the drive through clinic, the drive up uh, prescription refill, a lot of the other things that we've done to, to try and minimize the number of people that actually have to go into the clinic and, and to minimize the, the gathering of people in waiting rooms there. And the last question for now, sir. Um, apparently the 4th of July is a big day in the, the American calendar. Um, Brandy has asked if there is any news on 4th of July events. Brandy, so, you know, we're still working through uh, some approvals as to how we're going to be able to celebrate 4th of July. And, and if you've been here in past years, you know, we always got together, had a big barbecue, um, a concert, you know, a big fireworks display. Uh, Patch Barracks, Husky Field was the was the biggest venue we had, and so that's the one we've historically used. Of course, you know, with the limitations on uh, on events, uh, we're trying to figure out how we can still celebrate Independence Day. Um, and so, the efforts right now is to figure out how we can do fireworks at each one of our installations, uh, so that you don't have to come to one location. We don't have to gather. Um, we're going to do some events virtually. I recognize that that with the uh, you know, with a lot of the limits lifted on on uh, gatherings that, you know, barbecues will not be everybody together on Husky Field. It'll probably be, you know, in, in the backyards with, with a couple neighbors gathered. Uh, and, and we'll do some events, you know, decorate your bike, uh, you know, chalk your walk. Um, there'll be some, some virtual things that we do together. Uh, it'll be a great, you know, AFN will continue to do their thing. We'll have, have a DJ leading up to uh, fireworks that uh, uh, that that happen, you know, that evening um, at each of the installations. If you don't live on post and you can't step out of your door to see the uh, to see the fireworks, then we're going to identify places uh, that that families can come on to to watch the fireworks. You know, that may be on the installation, that may be off the installation, but the intent is to have fireworks at each of our installations, um, and still working through some of the you know some of the approvals. Uh, the, the bureaucracy here in, in the local community is incredibly impressive. Uh, and so as we, we work through that, um, get the contracts in place, then, uh, then I'll, I will publish all the specifics as we go from there. So I think with that, um, appreciate all the questions, uh, all the questions in advance. Um, uh, hopefully we gave a lot of good news tonight, um, you know, with respect to how things are continuing to move toward you know, what we all remember just several months ago. I'm looking forward to the day when I'm able to look in to this camera, talk to this community and say, you know, it's no longer COVID day. We're not there yet. Um, I appreciate all the, all the efforts to spread the word about things that have changed, how they're continuing to evolve. I'm going to ask that you use the app, um, you use the, um, you know, stuttgartcitizen.com as you find things that, that don't match what you see out there in the community, please let us know. We do our best to police up all the information out there and, and to update things as they change um, and, and don't always get that right. Uh, so as you find those things, please let us know. Uh, I appreciate all the all the experts out there that, that helped answer questions, followed up uh, with follow-up questions uh, that, that uh, you know, that, that answered those that, that perhaps came in after I had said something. Um, and, and I appreciate your attention. I appreciate what this community has done uh, as we've fought this virus together. Um, a lot of effort at, at every echelon. It's allowed things like the impressive uh, high school graduation that we had last night, um, where we, we you know, wished 185 seniors best wishes as they departed for whatever's next. Uh, and I look forward to other things as we, you know, this weekend we've got the the anniversary of, of the invasion of Normandy. Um, you know, we've, we've got the Army's birthday, 245th birthday that's coming up. Uh, so then, you know, there's, some, there's a lot going on in our community. And uh, as we get more updates, as I get more information, uh, I'll be very quick to share that with the community. So thank you very much. Congratulations once more to our Stuttgart High School Class of 2020 seniors. Um, and 
Every day is COVID day until it's not. Keep your hands clean. Mask up when you can't keep that six feet of distance. Stay vigilant. Stay healthy. Have a great evening. Thank you.